In the previous episode, I confronted Singaporeans with a test. I, as a minority myself, I do not expect myself to be doing this badly. I don't think I'm biased, lah. <laughs> Am I? The test reveals how we all have racial prejudices. I think it's kind of dangerous. Researchers call this phenomenon implicit bias. I'm Janal Puducherry, chairman of OnePeople.sg. In the first part of this documentary, I looked at how the experience of racism here in Singapore isn't just uncomfortable, it can result in discrimination with far-reaching consequences, affecting our livelihoods and the ability to rent a home. In the second part of this documentary, I find out what it would take to overcome these implicit biases. Right now, I don't think there's any study looking at both brain and behaviour. Is relying on computers to prevent discrimination the answer? So even if a thousand candidates apply for a job, every single one of them actually gets a chance to do an interview. Or if the work falls on each and every one of us, what must I do to make you care? I'm going to ask you to put a tick next to the names. Those that you consider to be of the same race as you. What must all of us do to hold ourselves more accountable? As Singaporean males, we all have to serve, like, on average, two years of mandatory military service. When I first went to NS, sad to say, I don't think I was that surprised by how prevalent or accepted race humour was, because I feel like that kind of humour has always been how we understood or communicated with each other. Uh, I had a buddy <laughs> who was like, you know, I mean, he was a Chinese guy. He, he'd bring up issues like Malays in the Air Force, for example, and he'd say things like, oh, but do you really think we should be you know, letting Muslim pilots handle these billion-dollar jet planes. Don't you think that's a huge security risk? For someone who's actually hearing this, the message that it conveys is that, yalla, um, that we are okay with you not being given equal opportunities. This is me, and this is Adip, the sound man, and Hui Huan, the producer of the show. She's Chinese, he's Malay, and I'm Indian. Show a human this photo, and we can't help but make assumptions just based on how each of us look. But to a computer, we're all just data. Previously, we saw how racism can come into play in the workplace. That's why companies are already turning to technology to remove humans and their biases from processes such as hiring. Like this AI-driven hiring platform developed in Singapore called Impress AI. Many major Singaporean companies as well as government agencies are already using their service. So, uh, how does this platform work to reduce bias? So, what I'll show first is the candidate side of the experience as they're clicking Apply Now. We allow every candidate who applies to go through a screening interview and at least reduce the chances of them being rejected purely based on the resume. So, an AI-driven chatbot interviews them, not a human? The first level. The first of, level, okay. Yeah, the first round of it. So, even if a thousand candidates apply for a job, every single one of them actually gets a chance to do an interview and give that information. And on the platform, the recruiters just see the unbiased information here and all the biasing information, like their name, gender, ethnicity, etc., is completely hidden. And your tool removes that opportunity for human bias. But doesn't it also then remove the opportunity for those people to then learn over time and get better at this? The AI doesn't make the final decision. It is just a tool that helps them do their job better at the end of the day. Introducing blind hiring is one way to make the process fairer. But that's just one aspect of racism in the workplace. I'm the only Indian at my workplace. I noticed that my colleagues always talk to each other in Mandarin. I found myself hating myself and my race and hating others for treating me like this. I feel distressed and marginalised at work every day. I don't know how to break out of this. These are accounts of casual racism in the workplace, told via calls and messages to a group called Mental Act. 
they run a 24-7 crisis hotline to support the mental health of Singaporean Indians. And they put out this post on Instagram in the midst of the pandemic. I've noticed you put this post out. Have you been getting a lot of calls to do with racist incidents? At least out of the 12 calls that we face in a night, we'll at least get about three to four calls that are talking about racist incidents. Prior to the pandemic, we didn't get that many calls with regards to racist acts. So what is it that they're experiencing then? Not the, not the racism, but their mental health issue from racism. A couple of things. The first thing that they feel is anger. Because the whole state of helplessness that even though you are in a very well-established, well-developed country, you are still made to feel like, you know, you don't, do not belong here. And they also question their existence that, hey, am I really that bad? How do they know that they have a mental health issue? Some of them, you know, they, they do realise that when they go out or when they meet someone from the majority community, they start to feel anxious. They start to, you know, move away from them or keep quiet. So the simple act of racism itself, to them, at that point of time, it's a very big deal and it eventually engulfs the way they think, the way they, you know, regulate their emotions and to some extent, you know, mental health distress or even going into mental health illnesses as well. At the National Day rally last year, Prime Minister Lee made this announcement. To deal with workplace discrimination, TAFEP has laid out clear guidelines on fair treatment. We will enshrine the TAFEP guidelines in law. This will give them more teeth and also expand the range of actions we can take. For this two-part documentary, I worked with the Institute of Policy Studies to commission a nationwide survey. The survey looked at the move to turn TAFEP's guidelines on fair employment practices into law. TAFEP is a tripartite organisation which supports those who face discrimination at work. And this had a high level of support at 88%, but here's where we hit a snag. According to our survey, when asked if they would report to the authorities workplace discrimination because of race, only 43% said yes. When the respondents were asked why they were unlikely to report workplace discrimination, 30% said the authorities can't do anything. 59% said that it was hard to prove that workplace discrimination happened. And 30% felt that unfair treatment is common and to be expected. I am meeting Sister Tana, a union leader who has represented workers in many tripartite organisations, including TAFEP. We've done a survey, and one of the questions we asked was that even if TAFEP's guidelines are turned into law, no one will actually be punished. And what we found was that 40% of Chinese agree that no one will actually be punished, but 58% of the Malays and 51% of the Indians felt that no one will actually be punished. Quite a jump between the Chinese and the non-Chinese. From my years of experience in dealing with grievances, I think the toughest is to prove that someone is being victimised due to race. The minority races, they are unsure that whether the employers will be punished until there's a proven case, mm. until it's been tested, trial tested. Uh, then only the confidence will arise. Do you think this difference might be because uh, the minority races understand how difficult it is to deal with enforcement in this space? Have you heard of subtle discrimination? Tell me. A lot of times, say, people do come to the union and say that I've been discriminated. It's very subtle. So uh, they, they cannot collate the evidence to substantiate their claim. This survey has impressed on me that while we can have the policy implementation and on the surface level everyone thinks it's a good idea, look deeper and you find that the minorities are more likely to think that it won't help to punish the perpetrators. The reason why I tried dating apps because I wanted to get to meet new people. I married my high school sweetheart. I was like the good girl, the ex school the prefect, and then he's like the jock, the basketballer. He couldn't speak fluent English. He would prefer to speak Chinese. I'm quite open about um, dating people in uh, the other race. It's a little unfortunate, you know, like, yeah, you know, you don't really match with uh, other races or so. And I even try to, like, um, ask my friends to, to teach me some Chinese words. Uh, so that I, I can like communicate with him better. I don't know how we made it work, but it, it worked out. <laughs> so 
so we met in secondary school. He was a senior, so we, we lived opposite each other, so we would take the same bus to school. I think he was the one who approached me first, and he's a Singaporean Chinese. We got married and all that, and we had a kid together. His family is very traditional. He kept me very away from his family. If I'm lucky, <laughs> I'll get one or two matches per day. We we'll match um, more Indian race uh, ladies. The, the pool is not out there. Lah. Yeah, you know, you don't really match with uh, other races or so. That's a, it's, it's a little sad. If I was Chinese, maybe things would be a little better. Who knows? In the last year, there's been a lot more talk on the experience of being a minority in Singapore. It seems like we are finally more open than before to discussions on race. But the survey we conducted reveals something surprising. When asked if minorities are getting too sensitive when people discuss racial issues, Overall, 53% think so. That's quite high, and I'm sure you're interested in the racial breakdown. 55% of Chinese agreed. 48% of Malays agreed as well. And 43% of Indians. I've invited Dr. Daniel Goh, a sociologist, to give some insight on these numbers. I'm actually quite surprised that higher than 40% of, of Malays and Indians feel that minorities are too sensitive about this. What kind of behaviours do you think would lead to this perception of being too sensitive? You know, in Singapore, we, the, the way we talk about racism has often been in terms of in politics and in the workplace and so on and so forth. People have not kind of talked about microaggressions and casual racism. Between everyday life experience of racism, where names are being used, jokes are being made about race and insensitivity. And now we are beginning to talk about them. And I think this newness is also affecting them. It used to be something that you talked about as our society, as yes. our country, as our yes. government, as yeah. our policy. Yes, yes. But now it's about now you it's, as a person. Yeah, so the question is, oh, am I a racist? No, what's wrong with this? We've been doing this all the time. We joke about, you know, race and national service all the time. And everybody appreciated the jokes, including our minority, you know, our brothers, you know. So why are we making a fuss right now? I think there's this newness about, about questions of casual racism, everyday racism and microaggression. Are minorities really getting too sensitive when it comes to casual racism? In her 10 years of experience as a psychotherapist, Kavita has seen many clients come in to unload on how casual racism has made them feel. They would describe distress, disbelief, often a lot of shock, shame. And that distress can manifest in an inability to get on with your life, to, to get things done? Interestingly, it's probably in two different extremes. Um, in one, they might be very isolated, um, have difficulty having you know, stable, um, healthy relationships. On the other hand, they might overcompensate. So they feel like they're not good enough, so then they do more, do better. And either way, it's not very healthy. They either get burnt out or they feel very inadequate. I would like her to help me with a social experiment. We're going to subject a group of brave volunteers to casually racist comments and monitor the effect in real time. Here's the twist. We're going to get only those of the majority race to listen to casually racist remarks. Hello, everybody. I'm Jay Meyer. This is Tiffany, Wesley and Kai and we are Tropic Monsters. We create content for social media. Let's go! Out of the four collaborators at Tropic Monsters, only Chinese members Wesley and Jeremiah will be taking part in this experiment. Besides the duo, we also have Cheryl Chua, a social media influencer, and Isi, a Gen Z TikToker. We specially chose the four of them because they are part of multiracial working environments. This is to reflect life in Singapore and the possibility of feeling excluded based on race. We will be tracking changes in psychological indicators such as their emotions and anxiety, as well as physiological markers such as heart rate and blood pressure. 
Some comments will be played back to you. If it gets too uncomfortable, please let the team know that you would like to stop. Uh, once you're ready, put on the headphones. Okay. Ni hao. Hey, it's ni hao, right? Is that how you pronounce it? Ni hao. These comments were recorded by professional actors. They are curated comments based on a research paper that identifies 16 categories of microaggressions. You're not like most Chinese people I know. Eh? You're the most honest Chinese person I've worked with. I guess I wouldn't be offended. It's not exactly offensive. And, and she said it's not exactly offensive. Mm. But her heart rate while she said that was quite high, 140. I think we can safely interpret that as a, a stress response. I'm so surprised you offered to help me. I thought like you'd be more, I don't know, stingy. <laughs> Are you stingy? No, I always try and break that stereotype. Okay. Because I'm definitely not stingy. I always give when I can, to be right. honest. So Wesley's heart rate went up a bit uh, at this point, 120, especially when he was talking about, I'm not like most Chinese people. It's, it's interesting that he felt that he needed to make a point, like he had an objective. Uh, I'll never date a Chinese oh. man. Why? <laughs> Why would you not date a Chinese man? <laughs> Chinese men, so nice. I don't know, just <laughs> like any other men, what? Hey, you Chinese, you confirm can eat anything. La. You finish for me this one, can? Ah, yeah, why not? Even pig organ you eat. Hello, first of all, pig organ is nice. Okay, don't. <laughs> but. Uh... He was quite offended, but he was flabbergasted. Yeah. By the end of the experiment, all four participants showed a stark physiological stress response. Increased heart rate and elevated blood pressure. And it's not over for them. So today is day one, and then I'm going to listen to the recordings now. And this is my second time listening to the conversations. To get a sense of the long-term effects, the participants will continue to listen to the same comments for seven days straight. So it's day three of listening to the recordings. I, I listened to the audio clips a second time today, you know, while I was doing groceries. After the seven days, the anxiety and negative emotions of the participants are measured again via a questionnaire. To be honest, a bit sick and tired, la, you know, sick and tired of these statements repeatedly said to me. Uh... Across the board, all of them registered stronger intensity of negative emotions. This questionnaire rates your mood. When we averaged all four of their scores for negative emotions, it increased by nearly 13 points, or 77%, compared to seven days ago. We also tested their level of anxiety with another questionnaire. Averaged across the four of them, their anxiety score increased by 6.6%. When these casual remarks are said often enough in a comment or a joke, it can start to get hurtful. I feel like I'm not these things. I'm not dishonest. I'm not stingy. Yeah, it makes me feel very targeted. Yeah, it's kind of starting to affect me a little bit. So I've become a lot more conscious of my my surroundings and my environment. I literally just shut the thing off halfway. I couldn't take it anymore. Yeah. I gather the four participants for a debriefing. What do you think is the source of this anxiety and this stronger intensity of negative emotions? The anxiety comes from uh, perhaps meeting people thinking that, hey, is this what they really think about us? Yeah. What about you, uh, Wesley? It made you more suspicious of people? Yeah. I'm a bit more conscious as to who chooses to sit, you know, beside me and everything. I mean, people have left. They sit somewhere else, like opposite. I wouldn't say suspicious of people, but I felt like I brought myself down a little bit. I felt very judged, like, by random strangers that I don't even know. So, there was a comment that you made on your vlog, uh, EC, that I think I need to call out. You're not like most Chinese people I know, eh? First of all, honesty and integrity is, like, one of the Chinese values. The Chinese race really, you know, they, they, they talk about integrity, they talk about 
being honest, honesty, filial piety, yeah. Definitely, I want to stand up for my own race, right? I'm just wondering why you wanted to characterize those values as Chinese values and not just, well, they're everyone's values. My emotions really got the best of me. Cheryl, what, what do you think is going on? So I think similar to them, at first I didn't really think much of it, but then towards the end, it did make me um, stop to think um, when people are making these comments. I think how I usually would would be just to uh, laugh along and not say anything. But after listening to all this recording, I did say that, hey, you know, we should not be saying these things. Uh, six days already, every day just uh, in my ear, you are stingy, you are dishonest, you are what else? Are being, you are whatever. Lah. So I, I, I'm feeling a bit hate towards this person and towards maybe his whole race even. Jeremiah, what, what happened to you? Actually, it gives me a bit of uh, more dislike for other races. I just feel angry. In Our participants are fully aware that the comments are fictional that they are recorded by actors. Yet, in just seven days, it has provoked such strong reactions of fear, anxiety, and even wariness towards other races. We did our experiment with just four participants. But there is research out there that links the experience of racism with poorer mental and physical health. A team studied brain scans of black women in America who had experienced racial discrimination. And the scans revealed a disproportionately greater activity in the brain regions related to emotional regulation and fear inhibition. The more experiences of racism that they report in their lives, the more activity was found in areas of the brain that are triggered when you're vigilant or threatened. The two areas that are particularly overworked are the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, used in processing risk and fear, and the middle occipital cortex, part of the visual processing center of our brain. Being in a heightened state of alert, vigilance, and fear can put a strain on the brain and the body. This can increase the risk of mental and physical health disorders. A lifetime of microaggressions can cause physical and mental damage. How do we ensure that our next generation can break away from experiencing such racial trauma? We, we got married and all that, and we had a kid together. So for two whole years, he kept us away from meeting his family. He was still worried about um, whether his family was able to accept me. Um, because I'm, I come from a different race. Only when our daughter turned two years old, then he introduced us to his family. After BMT, I was actually posted to the Signals Institute. Well, the role was supposedly sensitive. I mean, because it's you're, you're controlling communication. Communications, communications, exactly. Yeah. You know, I had uncles saying like, ah, you know, you're the token Malay who's just in there so that we'll all keep quiet and we won't accuse them of racism, things like that, right? I guess the dangerous things about having these ideas sort of like floating around is that it's easy to, to pick them up quietly without even realizing yourself. I think we like to think about racism as something that is like openly aggressive. But very often these very subtle ideas that we are sort of quietly carrying around with us is also a very small form of like oppression. Earlier, we demonstrated in the show that casual racism may sound harmless, but it can have serious psychological effects. So when do minorities in Singapore start feeling these effects? These children from the minority races are between four to six years old. Wow. Wow, that's wow. a lot. I'm recreating the famous doll test. These three dolls are identical with just one difference, the color of their skin. The dolls are meant to represent the different races. 
The kids are first asked, which doll is the nice doll? The first one. Yeah, this one. Because the skin is shiny. Next, they're asked, which doll looks like a bad doll? This one. Mm -hmm. This one. This one. Because this is bad baby. Because the brown is so dark. He is no cute. I think this one. Chinese I don't really like. One plays me and all the other never plays me. And then, which is the smart doll? Because I like the peach colour. Oh, smart. This one. This is the third one. Because I just know brown is smart. Because my father is smart. And then they were asked, show me the doll that looks like you and your family. This one. Because the skin almost the same. Because it's dark brown. Finally, they were asked, which doll do you want to be like the most? This, this one. Mm, this doll. I want to be born peach colour. This test was created in the United States back in the 1940s. African-American kids also responded similarly to these questions, revealing that racial prejudice and discrimination in society can create feelings of inferiority in children. Unfortunately, our small replication of the experiment with Singaporean kids seems to demonstrate that they have similar feelings. So what can we do about it? I took some time, but I finally came across a study with promising results. It's an app for young children, and it's been shown to be effective in reducing their racial bias. I connect with the researcher behind this study. Hi, thanks for taking my call. Dr. Miao Chen from University of Detroit Mercy. In her training app, children are introduced to faces of a race that is not their own. This is David. A child is told that each face has a name, and the child has to tell apart up to five different faces by matching each face to the correct name. Why get the children to do that? We try to push children to think about people from other race as individuals instead of lump them together as a group, because we know categorization process lead to stereotypes and prejudice. So why did you choose to focus on children? So implicit bias is difficult to change. But with children, we find some very promising evidence. Children's bias are relatively easier to change. And when you change that in children, it's relatively stable. The effects are relatively long-lasting. So now you're getting children to actively scrutinize people of a different race to tell them apart. Why wouldn't this work in the other direction? Get them to ignore race, be race blind, so to speak. So first of all, we know that color blindness won't work. Infants from very early on, about six months of age, they recognize different races. And the children from about six months old, they already show a own race preference. We cannot just, uh, you know, kind of neglect race The idea is that kids can be trained to look at someone of a different race as a unique person, instead of just a stereotype of his or her race. With Miao Chen's help, we designed something that could possibly work in our preschools. Hi, everyone. Hi. Okay, 
we have some cards here and I'm going to tell you their names, okay? Uh, what do you think about her? She has brown skin. She does have brown skin. And she has a green dress. She, she has a name. Her name is Shanti. Shanti? I'm going to go on to the next one. Well, who's this? Hmm? Why do you think she's Malay? She covered her hair. Okay, but her name is Shah. Shah. It's okay. Shah. Okay. It seems that before the kids got familiar with these characters' names, race was the first thing they pointed out. His name is Raj. Raj. Okay. His name is Joe. Joe. What's her name? Do you remember? Shah, that's right. My job is to get them to memorize the names of each character so they'd be able to recognize them by name instead of race. This is Raj. Raj. Yeah. Many rounds of repetition later. Shah. Okay, we'll see, see who can remember. Who's this? Rita. Rita. She's smiling. And how about this one? He has here. Yeah. She likes to dance? Why do you think she likes because. to dance? Because she has a skirt. Because she has a skirt, she likes to dance? Yeah. You could see their behaviour changed a little bit. OK, what about this guy? I think he loves to bust his feet. They made stuff up. But to my mind, that was a striking thing. Put a name there and suddenly these become people. They, they have imaginary lives. There's a story there that the children want to know about. OK, I'm going to put a few here. You can have a look. By encouraging kids to categorise each face even further as individuals with their own names, instead of the broader marker of race, it can reduce their implicit racial bias. Dr Miao Chen is pursuing her research in the United States. In Singapore, we're breaking ground in a different way. This toddler doesn't know it, but we're actually measuring her subconscious reaction to these race-based images. What's that? Hi. We're also measuring her mother's reactions to the same images. This is a pilot trial conducted by Dr. Atika Azari. This will be the first study in the world to track how much influence a parent has on shaping racial biases at the brain level on a young child. So just now, we were looking at the brain responses of the mother and child when we were viewing faces of different races, exactly. What we're interested in is how similar the brain responses of the parent and the child are ah. when interacting with its stimuli. The mother or the child? Dr. Atika and her team have been studying how deeply attuned a mother and her child are to one another. They want to know how much a child subconsciously picks up on how the mother perceives a person of another race, even if the mother is not actively trying to teach a child how to do so. So is it because they're picking up on these unconscious signals? That could be one potential reason. So that is something that we really want to find out because right now, I don't think there's any study looking at both brain and behaviour. It'll take a few more years before they can publish conclusive findings from the study. But until then, what do we do about the implicit racial biases that we all have? We've been talking about confronting it, and that seems to be the common theme. That's exactly what I'm going to do. So sometimes, actually, the casual racism doesn't have to come from individuals of different races. So I had, like, a Malay commander who was also, like, you know, saying the Malays in, in BMT always put in less effort because, you know, your community is so easily contented. You're not going to, you know, aim for command school or whatever. There was once uh, someone was calling a fellow serviceman like a racial slur. And I, I was sort of the, the third man in the situation. I felt a bit caught in between um, because the person that it was being said to kind of just quietly accepted it, let it deflect off him. It felt wrong or weird 
almost for me to step in and tell the other guy like, hey, you should cut this out. That's something that, that now, now that I think about it, I wonder if I would have done differently. Yeah. Sometimes it can be difficult because numerically you're already outnumbered and so sometimes it's the path of least resistance is really just to kind of suck it up and kind of either laugh along, keep quiet or even repeat the racist joke yourself. So later on I kind of figure out it's more complex because a lot of these ideas are, you know, not ours to begin with. Like people internalise them and it's really more of like our responsibility later on to unlearn um, a lot of these prejudices. I, I, I guess I'm sad to say I was blissfully unaware <laughs> until you start, look back and you think about it and then you realise all these things are like not quite okay. So two years into the marriage, we decided to get a divorce. We started doing co-parenting and, and when we got more involved with our daughter's life and doing the whole parenting thing, we realised how important it is to sort of preserve both cultures. And that was when we started learning each other about each other's customs and beliefs. Ironically, it happened after the divorce. <laughs> if, let's say, I could turn back time, I would probably do it differently. And um, I would definitely want to get to know his family first. I've gathered a bunch of people who are game enough to face their racial biases head on. <laughs> Of course, we have Harish and Terence, who recognise their own implicit bias in a test in the last episode. Jack and Ray are a musical duo who have worked with each other for over 20 years. Shazwan is a young hip-hop artist, known for his iconic sarong outfit and for rapping in both Malay and English. While Ketanya, who once publicly admitted to being bullied for her Indian name, is a familiar face on local TV, Finally, we have Sophia, who plays a Malay character in a long-running English sitcom. Okay, thanks everyone for joining us here today. We've got a little experiment. First, I want to help them realize where each of us stands in accepting diversity, subconsciously. I want you to write down a list of names of people, people you know who are the closest to you, who are not your family. So you, the viewer who is watching this documentary now, you can also pick up a piece of paper and write down 10 names as well. On that list should be people who would help you out if you're in trouble, maybe at work. If something happened to your family or a loved one, or people you might call and say, hey, can you give me a hand? <laughs> so now you've got 10 names on the right-hand side. I'm going to ask you to put a tick next to the names. If you consider them to be the same age as you. They're my age, my generation. Now, the next one, they're the same gender as you. Okay, so the next tick, then, is if they have the same educational background as you. Okay, and no surprises. When you're done with that, put down your blue pen, take up the red pen, and those that you consider to be of the same race as you. From the number of ticks next to each person's 10 closest friends, I can determine how much diversity is in each person's inner circle, based on four categories, age, gender, education, and race. The more ticks they have, the less diversity there is. I collate their results. And what we find, all of you have at least five names with at least three ticks. Age, gender, educational background, or race. All of you have at least half of your ten closest associates, or pretty much they're you. What I've noticed also is that those from the majority race have more ticks in the race column than those of the minority race. In the last episode, we revealed that most of us have implicit biases. This experiment they just did reveals one way these biases show up in our personal lives. In this case, it's a subconscious bias to prefer people who are just like you. 
I'm gonna start with Jack and Terence, you know. Because you've had the highest number of people with all four ticks, ticks in all the categories. Mm. Out of the 10 names on their list, Jack had seven names with the maximum number of ticks, indicating they're all just like him in age, gender, education, and race. While Terence had six out of 10 names with the maximum number of ticks. I think it's an unconscious thing for myself um, until you pointed it out. And uh, yeah, I've got so many ticks on the, the same race category. There's definitely a comfort zone because uh, language, culture, all these things. Like when I speak to Harish, sometimes I, you know, even if I curse in, in Chinese or something, I have to explain to him what the curse word meant. Contrary to what Terence said, I do understand a lot of Chinese swear words. <laughs> <laughs> Some, yeah. but... Is it easier if we're a minority to have people who are not quite like us in our social circle? I feel like because we are the minorities here, I think we've had to adapt a lot more. So that has made, like, having more diverse friendships with people of different backgrounds easier, I guess. Actually, on this list, I only have one friend that's Chinese. OK, but the rest are just not quite like you. The rest are mixed Eurasian, um, Indian, French. OK. So it's like a mix, very diverse. OK. Is it, is it then harder for the Chinese Singaporeans to have that multicultural experience? I think there will always be this issue uh, for, for the majority race because of the circumstances. You can get by with not reaching yeah. out. So there is a comfort zone with, with race, but I do remember when I was living overseas, knowing that I was an Asian minority, there was an inclination to, OK, I got to try and assimilate a little bit more into people's culture. That's kind of ironic, isn't it? Yeah, why? Because when you go overseas and you are in another country, you force yourself to go out to yeah. look. Around. But then we are also minorities here, right? We don't force ourselves to go around looking for, the, you know, a different yeah. culture, right? So why, is, why, why did that happen? I think the majority will always have this affinity bias, but it should be encouraged that they recognise it and not shy away from it. And not that it's, uh, they should be vilified for it. But if there's a, a skills future course they can take, or, you know, that might help. Yeah. What to do on Deepavali? Yeah, please don't shame us. <laughs> so we then also need to think about how this affects us as a society. We did a nationwide survey for this documentary, and one of the questions that we asked was which race do you find acceptable for certain roles in the workplace? First, we began with what would be an acceptable race for a colleague. So 97% felt that it was okay to have a Chinese as a work colleague. Pretty high still for Malays and Indians. We then asked, what would you find acceptable for your subordinate? And again, almost everybody said they'd be quite happy to have a Chinese subordinate. When it came to the minority races, Malays and Indians, this dropped to 83% and 81%. But we asked another question about which race you'd find acceptable to be your boss. And here again, almost everybody found it was acceptable for a Chinese person to be their boss. Mm -hmm. But when it came to the minority races... What? Whoa! Wow, well, that's a big difference. And the same for Indians. Oh. Wow. Mm. Disappointing? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, does it also have to do with, you know, I mean, maybe a little bit of affinity bias in the sense of the connection? Or like, same race as you, and, and therefore, you, it's easier you kinda, to schmooze, you know? You kind of connect, right? right, in right. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, like, if you want to pre please your boss, I, I know what to send a Chinese boss for Chinese New Year. But if you tell me, oh, my boss is Malay or Indian, you know, for their holidays, what do I do then culturally? You, then you take the skills future course. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we asked our survey respondents, how long will it take before there's no more racial discrimination and Singapore will be truly regardless of race? So, some people kind of took extreme views and basically said either we've settled the matter or it's never going to happen. We're a little bit more interested in the people who actually put a time on it. But we then broke down the respondents by race. The Chinese respondents largely felt we'd get there, but it's going to take us some time. Our Indian respondents were a little bit more hopeful that we would get there a little bit faster. But our Malay respondents felt it would take much longer. Why is that? Yeah, I was just thinking maybe could it be the Malays were more pessimistic about it because maybe they have faced a brunt of racism, to say. So that, that was my thought. I'm still wondering why the Indians are so optimistic. Um, I think maybe the Indian diaspora has many examples of 
of how uh, you know the Indian ethnic communities have assimilated in cultures and even risen to you know positions of power. Let's say the Google CEO, for example. So so just understanding that maybe they're very optimistic that it can happen in Singapore quickly as well. I'm, I'm half Malay, half Punjabi. As someone who's a little bit of both, uh, I definitely feel it a lot more on the Malay side of things. If I had a primary school friend who was Indian and he went to a good school, for example, RI, I would just be like, yo, congrats on getting into a good school. But if I had a Malay friend who got into a great school, I'd be like, yo, Malay in RI, bro, that's crazy. Honestly, I'm looking at this chart and I, it doesn't really make sense. I don't understand why Indians, they are more optimistic, why Malays are a bit more pessimistic. For me, I feel like both minorities have faced a lot of racism. There are certain microaggressions and things that, as, as minorities, we can feel that are racist. There may be a, a Chinese person, maybe they only view racism as like blatant racism. So they, yeah. they, they don't really count the other things. I think what we can do is really just stop like with all the racial jokes, because I feel like, like a lot of the minorities, they kind of make fun of themselves as well to fit in. So like, say for example, Malay, they say like, oh, like you're late, oh, because I'm Malay, or I feel this, oh, because I'm Malay, or like, oh, you're lazy, you know, I live far. So I feel like what we, they can do for themselves is speak high, more highly of themselves as well and stop bringing themselves down. Because of the fact that they keep bringing themselves down, other races kind of like, they assume that that's how you look at yourself as well. I wish I could end the show by saying that we've gotten better at this as a people over the last five years. But I've come to realize it's not that simple. The science shows that we can be racially biased without even realizing it. But the good news is that we're far more willing to talk about it now as compared to five years ago. In making this documentary, I've also met many who are trying to do something about it. Building technology, developing research, and creating conversations around race issues. And on an individual basis, we are all trying to hold ourselves more accountable. Uh. So, regardless of race, will we get there? Maybe not so soon, but am I hopeful? Very. <laughs>